Again, thanks for joining us. And I will pass it off to our executive director, Brian Lee Wisenhunt. Thank you, Brett. So tonight, um, I'm really excited to perhaps introduce you to the work of Melanie Yazzie and a piece that's a relative new addition to the Rockwell Collection. I'm gonna start by giving you a little bit of background on her life and context for her work and practice because I really think it will help us understand and decipher the symbols and messages that are part of the work. And then we're gonna discuss printmaking technique a little bit. And there's so much we could say about printmaking. There's so many details we can go into. I'm gonna to try to keep it high level, but I think it's important to understand because um, Yazi's process is really unique and special. Uh, and so we really kind of have to have a context to understand that. And then we're going to look at and decipher, try to decipher some of the symbols that are part of this work. And I hope that you'll help me do that because I have some ideas based on what I know about her work and her practice Practice, but I think you might have some as well. And then we're going to make a cocktail that's inspired by the work. So this is the print that we're going to look at tonight. It's by, um, as I said, by Melanie Yazi. And um, Melanie is of the Saltwater and Bitterwater clans, um, which is part of the Navajo Nation, or Diné, as they are known uh, to themselves. And the title of the work is Carry It Forward. And it was completed in 2014. Uh, it's a monotype on paper. And the museum acquired it in 2019, and we acquired it using funds from Clara S. Peck. And she, if you're not familiar with Ms. Peck, we've talked about her a lot in the past, but she's a very important part of our story. And she donated both art and funds to the museum. And those funds are what we use to, uh, to make new acquisitions and to diversify our collection. I wanted to bring in a couple images. Uh, and I know that in the link that Janelle sent that there was a video from uh, the moth of Melanie Yazzie telling a story. And I hope you had a chance to understand that because um, personally, I've had the opportunity to work with her in the past. We did an exhibition of her work at my uh, previous museum. And so I do know Melanie. And so I don't, I try not to refer to artists by their first name, but we do have a personal connection. So if I slip in to the familiar, then please forgive me. But but um, as I said, Melanie's of the is Diné or Navajo, and she's of the saltwater and bitterwater clans. And if you're not familiar, uh, the Diné are, is a matrilineal society, and they're also matrilocal. Um, and each person that's a part of that society belongs to four different clans. So the first clan, uh, whenever you're introducing yourself to someone, especially someone that is also Diné, the first clan that you would give is the clan that is from your mother. So she's saltwater. Um, saltwater clan on her mother's side. The second clan is her father. And then if you really want to get into detail, the third clan that you would uh, introduce yourself as being a part of is your maternal grandfathers and the fourth your maternal grandmothers. I mean your maternal your paternal grandfathers, sorry. So there um, so there is a, a focus on family and connections that's very important to the culture and very important to Melanie. She studied um, art as an undergraduate and has a master's degree in printmaking, and she teaches at the University of Colorado Boulder. And she, her work is included in museums around the world, um, from Europe uh, to Australia, all across North America. And she's had over 500 solo exhibitions. So she's the prolific artist that is continuously producing, exhibiting, and processing her experience. One of the things that's very important to her process is to connect her work and her story to other indigenous communities around the world. And she feels that that's very important. While um, each, um, the, the effects of colonization on different indigenous communities is different, she feels that the experience of a contemporary indigenous person in society, there's a lot of things that are relative and a lot of things that are connected. And so she works as part of her practice um, to travel the world, to do uh, printmaking workshops, to exhibit and to connect with other indigenous communities. The other thing that's really important to her is her relationship with animals and her connection to them. And animals are a lot of the imagery that she uses in her work. And this is something that if you uh, did have a chance to hear her story, she talked a lot about the animals on her grandmother's farm and property and in their home. Um, but it's also a part of her contemporary life and the way that where she lives and where she chooses to live uh, is partly due to uh, her relationship with animals and her desire to have them around her and to have them be free and interact with one another. 
The other thing that I want to share is that she's also a diabetic, which seems like an odd thing, an odd detail to share about an artist, but it's something that is important to her. It's a condition that impacts numerous indigenous people around the world as a result of both genetics and the effects of the Western diet that was brought by colonizers. Um, so it's a part of her story. It's a part, one of the ways that she connects with people, whether they're indigenous or not. Uh, and it also um, is something that makes its way into the imagery of her work. And I'm sharing some of those details because I think they might help us look at her work and discern what some of these uh, symbols and images are. Um, and they'll give you, they're kind of a little bit of clues and a little of a path to understanding her work. So when we talk about printmaking, and this is gonna be kind of um, high level, as I noted, you know, a print is a way for an artist to create multiple versions of the same image. It's a way for them to take an idea and disseminate it very broadly. And there's different ways and different techniques. There's so many, there's just numerous printmaking techniques. There's some that are very commercial, like this gift that might be making you a little dizzy right now of screen printing, but there's others that are really specific and use very um, specific types of paper and inks and different tools. And we could really spend um, all evening and the next day, the next day talking about printmaking technique and really digging into it. But to um, think about how artists might use printmaking, this is a painting by Albert Bierstadt, the Rocky Mountains, Landers Peak from 1863. And um, Bierstadt's career is a really good example of how an artist might think about their prints. And this is a painting from the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in, um, in New York City. And it's very similar in scale uh, and subject to Mount Whitney at the Rockwell Museum, if you're familiar with that work. The, the difference is that in this painting, Bierstadt has included uh, bands of indigenous people here in the foreground um, against the, the peaks of the Rocky Mountain. Um, but Bierstadt in his career was one of the most successful successful and wealthy artists of that time period. And one of the reasons is that he didn't limit himself to just creating these large scale paintings that might be seen in a museum or at one of the, the big um, expositions that went on in the late 19th century. Um, rather, he was interested in capturing every market. So he made these large paintings, he made smaller paintings for drawing rooms. And then he also commissioned other artists like um, James Smiley to create prints of his uh, paintings so that they could be sold uh, to, the, to a lower cost that people could afford. There are even instances where um, Bierstadt's images were reproduced on newsprint in a newspaper. So it was kind of a bonus. So if you bought the newspaper, then you got this copy of one of Bierstadt's paintings um, that was done on newsprint. So he really tried to capture every market. In this example, it's the same, the same subject matter. It of course doesn't have the brilliance of the oil paint on canvas because it is a steel plated etching and engraving that was then hand colored. Um, so this is kind of a way that an artist might think of printmaking as a way to uh, make their work more commercially acceptable. Um, another example is Andy Warhol. And this is his print, Annie Oakley, which is from the Cowboys and Indian Suite that's in the Rockwell Museum's collection. It was a gift of Maisie and Jamie Houghton in 2000. And I think Warhol is a really good example of uh, an artist who uses printmaking techniques because of the inherent um, qualities of them. So Warhol used six silk screens and that really enabled him to layer color on top of found photographs or images that he created of people and, and kind of create these, uh, these paintings that were very exuberant, that had wild color, that had all these layers uh, and really became you know, his indicative style. So uh, there's, and there's many examples of artists who use printmaking. Some, some printmakers are devoted to a single technique, others run the gamut. Um, some painters dabble in it. So it's, you know, there's a, a wide variety, as many different um, uh, prints and printmakers out there as there are artists. Now, a monotype is kind of a little confounding because I just told you the whole point of printmaking is to make multiple copies of something. But a monotype, as you're probably assuming from the word, means one. It's a, it makes one print. So it's a form of printmaking that produces a single print or image. So in many ways, it's kind of the antithesis of the whole concept of printmaking and a bit of an anomaly. And you may be wondering, well, why would someone make a monotype? Why wouldn't they just make a painting? Um, and to understand 
understand that, you kind of have to understand um, how a monotype is created. And this is a monotype in sepia that was done by John Sloan in about 1908. And we do have several prints by Sloan, uh, mostly etchings in the collection, as well as a painting. And then we also have a painting by Sloan that's on loan to us from the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And to make a monotype, what an, an artist like Sloan would would do is to take a plate um, and currently most people when they're doing a monotype they use a, a plexiglass sheet but there are other materials that you could use as well and then they would apply the um, the ink to that plate using a variety of materials so here you can see that uh, Sloan has probably used um, some brushes maybe some other tools and then in some cases he's even wiped some of the ink away to give that light and dark quality to it um, so in this image he He's done this very quick um, presentation of a family. So you've got the father that's kind of standing over the mother who's holding a baby. And there's enough of this, um, the representation of these people that we can see what's happening as well as the pram that's in front of them. And then what Sloan has done is he's gone into that ink and used maybe the back of a brush or a stick or some other element and also kind of drawn into it to give some finer detail and to call out some of the aspects. So once that's all done, uh, then a piece of paper is laid over that plate a piece of cloth is laid over the paper and then it's run through a press and the image is transferred and fixed to a piece of paper. But still the question like, why wouldn't you just paint it? Um, historically, artists would use this technique as a way to do preparatory sketches. So it was a way that they could work very quickly, but still keep what they'd done um, on a piece of paper as a reference. Uh, but it soon really became prized uh, for some of its own qualities. Uh, for one thing, the monotype really records the hand of the artist. So in this quick print that Sloan has created, we can see the movements of his gestures. We can see how he's applied the ink. We can see um, what he's done. But the other thing that's inherent to the technique is of course, chance. So you put the ink onto the plate, you add the paper, but when you run it through the press, there's a lot of different things that can happen. Um, and one of those things is the, the um, it are different textures that may emerge because of the pressure that is used, uh, because of the paper that is used and how it absorbs the ink. Uh, so monoprints really became, or monotypes rather, really became prized uh, for their texture as well as the way they capture both the movement and the process and the hand of the artist. Here's one other example. This is an example by Maurice Prendergast, who is another American artist. He was part of the eight that exhibited with Henry and Sloan in the early 20th century. And this is a monotype that he created. It also has pencil editions after it was done. Uh, and this is of the orange market. So he's uh, created this just um, beautiful image of umbrellas and oranges and vendors and shoppers in this orange market. And again, this is done in that same technique where the, the where the the ink is applied to, to a plate and then transferred to a piece of paper. And one of the things you have to think about, especially in, in an image like this, um, that's different than the one that Sloan did, is the application and how those colors will, will mix together or how in what order you might apply them. Because again, what's on top is what's going to appear um, on the print. Any questions about printmaking or monotypes before we talk a little bit more about Yazi's print and specifically. So this, um, back to Melly Yazi's Carry It Forward, um, I think one of the things that um, a lot of people might think when they first see this work is that it's very simple, that's very um, elementary, that, uh, that it's kind of almost childlike, but it's actually an incredibly sophisticated work, not just with the subject matter, but the process. Um, the first thing I want to call your attention to in looking at and talking about the, the process that Melanie brings to monotyping is the paper. So if you look closely, you can see that the edge of this paper is, is rough, that, it is, um, that it's not a straight edge, and that's called the decal. And this uh, print has a full decal, which means that it is a complete sheet. There's a decal on all four sides. 
When you're looking at a print that has a clean edge, that means it's been cut down. That someone has used a partial sheet and they may have even cut the decal off to give that clean edge. Melanie's using the entire sheet of paper as it was created um, and made to be used. And what you'll also notice is that her ink and her pigment goes all the way to the edge of that. She's used the entire sheet as uh, her plane. Um, and that means that the, um, that the um, plate that she's using is larger than this, this sheet of paper that she's working on. The other thing that you have to understand about Melanie's process is that she's not thinking one print at a time. When she sets down to make work, uh, she really doesn't set down to do it because you know she's standing most of the time when she's printing. When she sets down to make work, she makes about 50 prints at a time. Um, but each of these, uh, but this whole process really only yields 10 prints that she considers finished and successful work. So I think, you know, you probably all know, like if you're making something, there's a whole sort of like getting up to speed on it, like getting it to where you're comfortable with it. And that's part of the process for her is finding uh, the, the place where the ink is moving as she wants it to, where the, um, the transparency of the inks are where she wants it to, that everything is working as she wants it. So, but just think about the fact that's only 10%. So only 10% of what she's creating actually is what she considers to be successful finished work. The other thing I wanted to point out is in the background, in that background, that red and that orange, that really brilliant warm color, um, that texture that she's achieving is from how she's applied the ink to the plate. So she's using a brayer, which is a small roller, and she's applying that um, ink in a variety of ways and creating this line and this texture. There may be some places where she's wiped it away. There may be some places where she's layered it where you can see more of the orange um, through the red. Excuse me. <clears throat> so that's part of her process is creating this texture. And that's the first thing she does is to cover the plate in the, in the solid texture or the background that she wants. And these figures and these symbols that she's created are actually stencils that she's cut by hand. And sometimes they're reusable. It really depends on what material she uses, but they're plastic or mylar. And each one of those is individually inked with the colors and the textures that she wants to use. And then they're placed onto the paper. And as we said with the other work, covered with the, um, they're cut, sorry, they're placed on top of the uh, plate and then that's covered with the paper and it's run through the press. Um, but there's there's a credible, lot, a credible amount of chance again that's available here uh, as far as how that texture is going to work out, how that ink is going to uh, move on the plate and transfer to the paper. And there's a lot that she has to know. It's a very sophisticated process. The amount of ink that she applies to the plate, the amount of ink that she applies to each of those stencils is our, all part of the equation that she's working on trying to get what she considers to be a successful work that has that line, that delineation between the colors and the figures. And then um, the other thing that is um, a part of it is just the, um, the idea of <clears throat> um, reusing some of these stencils. So in some cases, if possible, she will re re reuse the symbol and other works, especially if she's working across a series that she's creating of these 50 prints at a time. Now, as we, does anyone have any questions about uh, Melanie's process before we move on? Brian, there was one question about the, the size of the work and um, I did share the, the frame dimensions in the, the chat box. Oh, great, thank you. And I'll also post the link in there as well to our uh, e-museum website so they can view more details on there. Great, thanks Brett. So as we move into the interpretation and trying to understand what messages um, that uh, Melanie's trying to share with us in this work, um, the first thing you, that you have to know is that when she was a young person and she would be out in the world with her grandmother and her elders, you know, they might be at a diner or at a restaurant and she remembers there being, you know, a paper placemat and on that placemat were symbols that were sacred to the Dene. 
And her grandmother said that this was not appropriate, that this was not how these symbols were to be used, that they were that they were sacred and they were, you know, part of their belief system and they shouldn't be used to decorate, you know, a placemat or to be used in a commercial way. And it's something that that Melanie really took to heart and is the basis of how she creates. So rather than use symbols that are, are sacred to her people, she's created her own symbols and she's created her own um, images that that tell her story and tell the story of her people and her place in the world um, as she moves through it. The other thing that's important to her is a dictum that comes from the Dene, which is walk in beauty. And it's, it literally means creating beauty and harmony as you go. And that is something that is uh, very important to her. And she feels is a part of her well being to make work that is beautiful and harmonious and expresses uh, beautiful ideas that connect people all over the world, she believes is, affects her health and her own personal well being. So as we look a little closer, um, there's a, there's this um, really really interesting use of symbols, and some of them I have an idea and I know what they are because some of them are used repeatedly in her work, and some of them I have a guess, um, but I hope you'll kind of look at them with me and kind of bring your own sense and your own ideas based on what I've shared with you about Melanie and her practice and her work. Um, so the main um, image in this section, this is the bottom left of the print, is a woman in a large full skirt, and this is an image that uh, appears repeatedly in her prints. Um, this is a Diné woman in a very large, full, traditional uh, skirt of the Diné with her hair uh, pulled up high on her head. And this is Melanie. So this is the, the symbol that stands for her as she's moving through the world. Uh, the other image on the top left um, I think is a flower. I was looking at this with Mary Mix. I had the great opportunity to look at this and talk about this print with um, Paul, um, our preparator, with Mary Mix, our director of education, also with Sherry Kirk, our uh, my uh, executive liaison. And it's really fun to look at works with, with people. And I love talking about art with uh, people, regardless of their art background or not. So Mary um, had a great observation and she felt that this flower was a silhouette of a sunflower because of how the petals kind of stick out above uh, the seed crown of a uh, sunflower. But I think that the, the image that's behind um, <clears throat> the behind Melanie, behind the woman, um, is a little strange. It feels a little different than the images in the other. Does anyone have uh, an idea or a, a reference that, that you might think that this symbol might be recalling or referencing? So moving over to the right side, there's a couple of other symbols. Um, on the bottom is a spiral. And of course, this is one of the oldest symbols in art history. It's seen on pottery, um, in cave painting, on, in, in engravings and petroglyphs around the world and has different symbols and different ideas, I think for a lot of different cultures. But one of the ones that is sort of, uh, you know, spans cultures and peoples and time periods is the idea of a spiral symbolizing a path or a, an evolution and a, and a change. Um, now the, the image above that, does anyone have a guess on uh, what that might be? Uh, we had a response, Brian, um, from Betty in the chat box, a uh, dragonfly. Perfect, exactly. And, it looks, and Meredith also shared dragonfly as well. It is a dragonfly. And the dragonfly is something that appears very frequently in many of uh, Melanie's prints. Um, and a dragonfly, you know, again, it's one of those images that uh, has a lot of different meanings, um, but often it stands for transformation and change. It changed, and especially because the dragonfly begins as a water creature and evolves into a, a, an air creature. So this really inherent idea of um, moving from one thing into another. Um, and the other thing that I read about uh, and when, when we're talking about dragonflies is that they travel across water. So there's this, uh, this sense of travel, uh, this sense of transportation that's also a part of that. Now here in the top left corner, this is the one I find really perplexing. This, this bird, or I'm not sure, I hope somebody has a, a good guess on this uh, image because like part of it kind of looks like a penguin, but then it's that doesn't feel quite right. So I think, but it, it feels like it's some type of bird, uh, definitely. 
And then below the bird is a sphere. And I think, you know, at first, I think, uh, you know, the reaction is tennis ball, <laughs> but that would be kind of an odd uh, inclusion in this. But then I started thinking about some of the other images that uh, Yazi has included. And a lot of it's about time and the passage of time. And when Paul and I were looking at this, he noted a secret clue that, um, that Yazi included in this. And so I'm gonna go a little, I'm gonna flip this image over and then I'm going to reverse it. And this, if you look, it's hard to see probably on your screen, but this is actually a calendar and it's December and June. And, uh, sh and so she cut the stencil out of some uh, material that had a calendar on it. And that calendar ink was transferred with her ink onto her print, but she also didn't reverse it. So it's backwards and it's kind of hidden. So there's this kind of hidden clue about the passage of time. Um, and I think, you know, I mentioned that she's diabetic and that's one of the things, the ways that she kind of references that in her work is the, uh, the role that time plays or the, uh, the aspect of time as far as managing her, uh, her health, as far as, you know, checking her blood sugar, ensuring she's taking her insulin when she needs to, managing her diet. It's very much a calendar-based, time-based, experience. And then in the right hand corner, um, there's this, this beautiful whale, I believe. And if we zoom in on the whale, again, she's included this little clue. And this is a calendar, uh, Wednesday the 28th. And in this case, the, the date and the words um, are not uh, reversed and we can read them. And, but again, she's used a material that's transferred with her print. And then Sorry, I'm going to go back one. And then this jelly bean. <laughs> I don't know about this green, this sort of green oval shape. Does anyone um, have a, an idea of uh, what it might be? You know, Brian, I had shared when you were away that it it's the shape of a kidney. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and the connection, the diabetic connection. Um, it's a great observation. I don't know. The other thing that um, Melanie did a series of landscapes where she conflated perspective. So uh, some of it was from above and looking at the landscape from above. So the other idea that I had about it was an island. So it's like this verdant island seen from above, which is contrary to how she's showing us uh, the rest of the imagery, but does align with kind of how she plays with that idea of perspective and view um, in her work. And then at the center is uh, is another bird. So there's the you know these sort of uh, these animals um, of of various um, of the sky of the sea. Um, the, it's kind of this interesting mix and playful mix. Um, <clears throat> So one of the things that's really important, as I said, to, to Melanie is this idea of travel and connection. And that's one of the things that, that is really important to her. She says that, uh, that her work and what she tries to, to share about her work reminds people that we were here before. This is part of our existence. This is part of who we are um, as indigenous people. And then she also says that, you know, um, her depictions of her experiences traveling the world are more than just recordings that the connections she says the connections to many different people are held in these images so to her it's not just um, observing and pulling together these ideas in these images but rather she's taking that experience um, she's taking those connections that she's made and she's imbuing this image with that. So it's almost um, a spiritual practice uh, as, as far as how I would see it. Um, so this is, I think, I hope that kind of gave you a little bit of a, a, a toehold into thinking about Melanie's work and also really helped to illustrate that this is a, even though this work may appear a little simple and may appear a little childlike because of its exuberant color and its animal imagery, uh, it's a very sophisticated work and um, not just in its technique, but also in its iconography. And I wanted to share that, um, that uh, Yazi is more, she, she does printmaking, she's a printmaking professor, she's a master printer, but she also works in a variety of disciplines. And so I'm gonna show you a couple of other images just to get a sense of how she applies the same, these same ideas, these same concepts to other work that she creates. 
So this is another print, um, the, another monotype that she's created. But again, it kind of shows you that layering and those ideas that she uses as far as the stencils in a different way. She also creates silver jewelry. Uh, and the jewelry, again, reflects these images, like the, the heart with a tree, a singing woman uh, with a fish and a bird on her head. So again, pulling in some of these same images, but in a really simple, um, simplified manner. She also creates larger sculptures, these large scale sculptures. The one on the left is grandmother, and it's a symbol that she uses repeatedly. The others, you know, we have these uh, these uh, these Dene women with their large skirts and their hair uh, pulled up. But again, she's pulled in these, this layering of symbols into the cutouts and into the silhouette. Um, so again, very again sim simple, but with a the high level of sophistication. And she also paints, and her paintings are much more, um, a much looser. They're a little bit more abstract, but she's still pulling in some of these same ideas of telling her story and in hopes that by her sharing her story with you, that you will be inspired to share your story in some way with other people and build connections. Because really that is what um, her, uh, her primary hope is in sharing her artwork and her perspective and her culture and her people with uh, the world. And this print um, by Melanie Yazi is currently on view at the museum in our special exhibition, The Social Landscape of the American Experience. And it's on view through May 31st. So if you come to the museum, I would invite you to take a, a very quick, a very long look at this work and look closely at some of the details that we discussed. And I know this print has been up for a while. So after this exhibition closes, it's going to have to rest and we probably won't see it for quite a while in the museum. So if you have a chance, then please come by and see that and the rest of this exhibition. Any questions before we move on to a cocktail? I don't see any activity in the chat box, so must be everybody's thirsty. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us. I'm going to um, stop sharing and um, <clears throat> move over to my cocktail setup. So hold on just one second. So whenever I selected this work uh, back in February, you know, it was full on winter. And I thought, well, this is a great choice because, you know, it's very, it, the color is amazing. It's very warm, um, has a sort of tropical vibe to it. Um, <clears throat> and then, by the time I got to the point of starting to work on it, I was like, well, it's April, it's spring. Um, but I know some of you are joining us from Texas and New Mexico. It's winter again uh, in Corning yesterday and today. So I guess it still feels uh, really appropriate. So I, I chose to make um, a cocktail that's one of our favorites to serve. We serve it for many years in the summer. It's called a honey girl cocktail. It's a very tropical um, in flavor. It's fun uh, in the summertime to serve to friends and it's uh, really refreshing when it's hot. So it has to, to start, it has um, two thirds cup of guava juice or guava nectar rather. And also two thirds a cup of pineapple juice. And this is a half a cup of frozen strawberries with syrup. And I'm sure that there's a way to make this out of fresh, delicious um, New York strawberries in the summertime and use a little uh, simple syrup, but I have not uh, converted the recipe as of yet, but I'm gonna do that this summer. So this is strawberries and, and their syrup that have been pureed, a half a cup, and then um, a half a cup of vodka. You could also use rum because it's a really tropical drink. So I think rum would also be uh, perfect in it. And then I'm just gonna stir that up. Everything was chilled before I started. And then I'm gonna serve that over ice. And of course, I've got a tropical umbrella to go in it and some pineapple to garnish it. You garnish it with pineapple and strawberries would be perfect. And then I've got some little plastic cocktail animals. So I'm gonna go with the mermaid. It's classic on the edge of the glass. So that's the honey girl. Cheers. Um, and speaking of pineapple, next month as part of our 
special membership month events, we're going to be doing a special uh, happy hour with the director. And I'm going to be talking about George Forster's Still Life from the Rockwell's collection, which features a pineapple. And when I was researching it, I discovered all of these completely new facts that were just amazing about the pineapple uh, in North America. So I'm excited to share those with you next month. So please join us. Brett, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Brian. That looks delicious. Um, I wish I was there to have the other uh, glass there. But thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, Brian mentioned membership month. If you haven't received anything in the mail yet, you will in the next couple of days. Um, we have a small token of appreciation that'll be mailed directly to you and also an update on some of the special offerings and discounts um, that'll be offered during the month of May. And it's just a, a small token of appreciation for all of your support um, over the past several years, but especially over the last year. So um, thanks for joining us tonight and continuing to stay engaged. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us for a couple of programs next month. And we'll, we'll stick around here for another minute, but um, that concludes the formal program. So thanks again.